All righty, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. How are you? Oh, that's terrible. Just terrible. Awful. Try again. How are you? Buenos dias. Como esta? Okay. Mil veces mejor. Gracias. So, thank you, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thanks for coming to my little talk. We have so much to cover and so very little time. So, please take a seat. Um, we're going to go through a lot of code today. I, I'm a big believer in code. I love code. I think if you're among the four billion people on the planet connected to the internet, code is the single most powerful, impactful thing you can do. So follow along with me at home, if you like, with that URL for later, uh, for your own reference. And uh, a little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I'm a Spring develop Developer Advocate for Pivotal. How many of you have heard of Pivotal? I'm sure by now it's sunk in just a little bit, but maybe, maybe not. Everybody, everybody know of Pivotal? Pivotal. Pivotal. We're a small company with big dreams. Pivotal. A uh, little bit about me. My name is Josh, as I say. I'm, I'm on the internet. I'm on the internet, and I'd love to talk to you there. I'd love to carry this discussion forward online. How many of you are on Twitter? Twitter. Twitter. 2016. Twitter. Twitter. Okay, what about email? Email. <laughs> Email, email, anybody? No, okay, awkward. Well, if you're on either of those social networks, please don't hesitate to reach me, don't hesitate to talk. We're, I'm happy to carry this discussion forward uh, beyond the confines of our little bit of time together here today. I'm also an open source contributor and an engineer. I am very proudly the number one, number one leading contributor uh, of bugs Two projects like Spring Boot, Spring, Va Spring Batch, Spring Integration, Vaadin, Timeleaf, Spring Cloud, Activity, etc. More bugs per commit than any other developer, seven years in a row. That's me. More bugs. Exactly. Number one. Number one. I'm also a Java champion. That dovetails very nicely with what I do in my day job as a Spring champion. And this means that I get to spend a lot of time in my day-to-days talking to organizations, customers, community members, etc., uh, about how to, how to win with Spring, how, talking to organizations like yourselves. Um, oh, by the way, I'm also a book author, right? This is the same book I've been working on for the last year. So if you were here last year, it's coming. <laughs> it's almost here. One day. Uh, this book... For those of you who are wondering, that's the blue-eared kingfisher from the Javanesian islands. So it's a, it's a bird from, from Java. Birds fly, get it? Java, Java bird, flying cloud. No? No? No. It, it's okay. It'll come. So, so anyway, I, uh, I, as a Java champion and as a spring champion, working at Pivotal, I spend a lot of time speaking to organizations and... Uh, uh, at Pivotal, we love open source, right? We love open source and the connection that it creates between us and the people that use it. Uh, but make no mistake, that is not the reason we go into business. It's not the reason we wake up excited every morning to go to the office. It's not the reason we're here. Nobody, go, nobody at Pivotal goes to work thinking, I'm going to work on open source and that's the be all, end all of my day. Instead, what we care about is helping users and community members and customers and so on move quickly and safely into production. Right? That's the goal, is to help people deliver working software as quickly and safely as possible. And we see that a lot of organizations struggle with this. They struggle because they know that they want to move quickly and safely, but they can't. They have these large existing applications uh, that present a bit of a burden, a bit of a, a challenge for them, because existing applications that were developed before the era, era of cloud computing are uh, hostile to rapid and agile iteration. These applications are unbroken, they're large, they have lar large teams, and so it becomes very hard to change them, to adapt them, to evolve them. And so organizations look for ways to go faster, and they look at these large existing applications, and then they say, how can I break it apart so that I have smaller parts, so that different groups of people, small groups of people can work on it independently, and they can iterate quickly without constantly having, to, having meetings and all this communication synchronization cost. And they look at this large existing application and they look for, for ways to, to break it apart and they look for 
Look at Dr. Eric Evans. Dr. Eric Evans has a book called Domain Driven Design. How many of you have ever read Domain Driven Design? In it, he talks about the idea of a, of, the, of a part of the domain model that when you extract it from the larger whole, stands unto itself internally consistent and reusable. This is called a bounded context. A bounded context is, is a part of the domain model of an application that you can crisply define, clearly define. If you can identify these bounded contexts in a large application, you can extract it from the large application and work on it and evolve it independent of the rest of the code base. And this gives you the ability to go fast. Now you can make changes, test it, integrate it, move it to production, get results, and then change again very, very quickly. You can go through that loop. And speed is a very, very important feature, right? What is the largest taxi company in the world today? Uber, right? What is the largest hotel company in the world today? Airbnb. What is the largest uh, video rental service in the world today? Thank you. Uh, and what is, in terms of year-over-year -year growth, the largest car company in the world today? Tesla, right? These organizations, these customers, these, these, these companies, rather, didn't have more people, they didn't have more intelligent people, they didn't have more money, they just had the advantage of speed. They had the ability to try something, make a mistake, fix it, and try again faster than anybody else. And now they're number one, they're the big ones. And it happened in record-breaking time. And that's all because they understood that when you mix something plus software, any business plus software, you end up with a software business. Cars plus software, you're a software business. Taxis plus software, you're a software business, and you have to differentiate yourself in terms of software. So organizations look for this, and they look for ways to go fast, and they look for ways to identify small parts of the application that they can focus on and deploy independently. These small, internally consistent, reusable, bounded contexts that are independently deployable, that's called a microservice. A microservice is a function of organizational agility, but they invite complexity, the architecture, involves moving things to small, separate, distributed components. So you have two problems. You have, first of all, the problem of standing up new services. You have to be able to stand up a new service quickly and support basic things like observability. You need to be able to support getting past all the requirements that are needed to be able to support that application in production. Most organizations that I have been to and talked to have the nightmarish, the dreadful, the scary wiki page inside their organizational wiki 500 easy steps to production, right? That wiki page is the enemy of velocity. And if you have to do 500 different things before you can deploy a new service, you won't. So one way to solve that is to use Spring Boot, which we'll cover ever so briefly today. Uh, but there's a lot of great talks here, and you saw some of what's coming in 1.4 in the, this morning's amazing keynote. And then finally, once you've moved to this architecture, once you've stood up lots of small collaborating services, and they're talking to each other. Now you've got a new problem. Now you've got components separated by network boundaries that are talking to each other. And this invites the complexity that's implied in distributed systems. And if there's one thing that I'm sure all of us can agree upon, it's that distributed systems are hard. So today, today we're going to go ahead and build a very, very simple service. Uh, and then we're just going to look at all the non-functional requirements that we need to support um, uh, above and beyond that service, and then we're going to look at building an edge service to talk to it using Spring Cloud. So those are my slides. What do you think? Yes? Yeah? Okay. See, I worked very hard on those. Oh, no, they don't have a great podium here. I think they wanted people to just do slides, and I'm terrible at slides, so there's that. So we're going to go ahead and begin our journey here today at start.spring.io. Let me see here. Let me switch this around. Okay, start.spring.io. If you know me, then you know that this is my second favorite place on the internet, right? My first favorite place on the internet, of course, is production. So production first, production all the time. If you can go to production, you absolutely should. It's amazing. Bring the family, bring the kids, bring your, bring your wives. I love production, and you should too. Or bring your husbands, you know, bring all the people to production. It's amazing this time of year. The weather is not as good as in Barcelona, but still, very nice. It's better than Disneyland, okay? But if you're not already in production, then you can start your journey to production here at start.spring.io. Now again, 
keep this bookmark, to keep it under your pillow, keep it close to you. It's my favorite place on the internet after production. If you want for inspiration in the early morning, before your cup of tea or coffee, start that spring that I owe. If your children are restless and they cannot sleep, start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion and seek relief, start that spring that I owe. So we're going to go ahead and build a very, very simple service here uh, in the interest of uh, going fast. I don't care about the domain model of that service. I'm going to go ahead and just build it uh, so that we have something with, with which we can play and with which we can, on which we can iterate, okay? So I'll build something called the reservation service. It's going to use Spring's web support. I'm going to use H2 because for, it's an embedded in-memory in database. I'm going to use the JPA, uh, Java Persistence API, because I make poor life decisions, so there's that. I'm going to use the config client and Eureka service registration and discovery support. I'm going to use Zipkin for distributed tracing and RabbitMQ for stream processing. And uh, that'll do, okay? Now, naturally, I could have gone here and elected to make other selections. And these are what I like to call non-choices. They're choices that you could make, but, 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 but you shouldn't, right? For example, you could elect to choose a different language. Actually, here's a great place to, uh, to make a choice. Absolutely, choose whatever language you want. Any language on the JVM that supports object annotations is fine. But here, you have a choice about the Java version, the JVM version. These are not choices. Don't choose 1.7 or 1.6. They're end of life. These are choices in the same way that running naked in the street is a choice. You could, but, but don't, but don't. <laughs> and then you also have the choice of packaging. And people get confused about this, so I'm gonna go ahead and explain here now when and where to choose which option uh, as quickly and as concisely as I can. If, by some freak fluke of physics, you find yourself stuck in the very, very distant past, far beyond modern help, then, then choose .war. But if you're here with me in 2016, then choose .jar. This is a big part of my overarching personal philosophy of make jar, not war. Now again, you can do what works for you, it's fine, okay? Now, let's go ahead and hit generate. We'll have, we've got a little service here. We're going to start it up. We're going to open this up. And again, I'm not going to spend too much time going over the basics in Spring Boot here. Let's get rid of all that. Uh, I might need some power, it occurs to me. And uh, we won't get too far without power. So in the interest of getting far, I'll go ahead and plug in uh, while you wait awkwardly. Come on. I just flew in from India uh, two hours ago. So I need power. Hello. Open source the electricity. Okay, very good. So now we have a new service. We're going to open this up in our IDE. And again, it doesn't really matter what you use. You can use any IDE you want. Uh, how many of you use Eclipse? What about NetBeans? What about uh, IntelliJ? Whoa, that looks like the majority. It's very interesting. OK, so we've got a, an IDE. I'm going to make my font a little bit bigger so that we can all see and we can play along. We'll choose more bigger. Okay. And uh, oops. what I have now is a very simple application. And I'm going to create a very simple entity of type reservation. Can you see that font from here? OK? Let me know if you can't and scream loud because my ears aren't great right now. So I'm going to create an entity. I'll say private long ID, private string, reservation name. And I'll create uh, some getters. There's this. And uh, this is going to be an ID and an at auto incremented value. So there's that as well. Uh, and I'll create a constructor. Here's this. And another constructor right, for JPA. Uh, <laughs> and a two string. And there we go. Now I need some way of saving and working with the data. In the database, I'll create a repository. I'll say reservation repository extends JPA repository of entities of type reservation whose primary key is of type long. 
Uh, and I'm going to make this a Spring Data REST object. So I'll bring in Spring Boot. Come on. Spring Boot Starter. Data REST. Oh, come on. OK. It's very hard. So REST repository support, come on. And there we go. So now if we start this up, we should have a REST API, but we won't have any data inside of it. So let's go ahead and insert some sample data like this. And this is a callback interface. When Spring starts up, it's going to see the callback interface, and it's going to call uh, the, the run method passing in the variadic array from public static void main. And we're going to tell Spring that we want a dependency to be injected as a collaborator. And here, we're going to say stream that of, and then Josh, and Phil, and Jennifer, and Gary, and uh, Sergey, of course, and uh, Dr. Dave, etc. And then we're going to say for each name, let's save a record in the database like so. And then we'll print out everything that comes back. Okay, come on. Telling it to call the print line method as we go. And there we go. So if we start this up, that should work. We should have data on the console, uh, and that should be a very simple API, and we can use that uh, as we need to. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Let's see. So there we go. Good stuff. There's our data. It worked. Of course it worked. It was always going to work. This was a demonstration. What were you expecting? Instead, I, as usual, I wanted to talk about this. If anybody knows me, you know that I care very much about this ASCII artwork. There are people on the Spring Boot team that did a lot of hard work to get this to work correctly, and so I'm very happy to talk about it now. This ASCII artwork took a long time. We have people on the Spring team who are doctors, PhDs. They worked in nuclear physics, and so it makes me very happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, they got a GitHub issue saying, we need to ask artwork and look at it. They did a good job. It's absolutely gorgeous. Now, sometimes people ask me, you know, can I remove it or can I change it? And I think that's a stupid question. Why would you want to remove this, you know? And it's at this point that I would like to take just a quick second and talk about what I consider to be a very big bug in the IntelliJ JetBrains product, because while I'm a fan, uh, I think this is a real serious deficiency. What the hell? <laughs> Why is this here? That's a dumb feature. And so, so I, went, I went online and I did what all adults do when confronted with challenge and struggle. I cried on the internet. And uh, I was greeted by my friend Jan Sabron, who's here by the way. <laughs> um, and he replied to me with a message of hope. So don't worry, my friends. We're going to make IntelliJ great again. Anyway, moving on. So now I've got an application. Uh, if you know about Spring Boot, then you know that by default, it's got a property file. And in that property file, application have properties, I can change all manner of different things. I can say server.port or management.whatever. And this is one way to change the default behavior of Spring Boot applications. Another way, of course, is to go to the command line here, like this, downloads reservation service, maven, minus d, skip tests, equals true, clean install. Uh, that's not a word. Okay. And I can override the default values by going to the target directory like this, java minus d, server.port equals 8010 minus jar. That would work, for example. Or I could use environment variables. I could say export server underscore port equals 8020, and then java minus jar, etc. And this all works, but the problem is uh, this becomes a little hard to manage as I start scaling out my instances or my services. If I have more than one instance or one, more than one service, I'm going to run into limitations. How do I change configuration live while the service is running? How do I centralize my configuration in one place? How do I support auditing and journaling to see who changed what and when, and if necessary, to roll back? And then how do I, if necessary, support sensitive encrypted information on the file system? For all of these reasons and more, I need something more robust, something like 
the config server, which Spring Cloud provides. So I'm going to go ahead and build a very simple Spring Cloud config server here. Here it is, config server, and I'll say generate. And the config server is a REST API that sits in front of my directory full of configuration. Uh, it's going to be a directory managed by Git. So the, the code is very simple to set up. I'm going to say at enable config server. I'll go to application app properties, and I'll say spring cloud config server git URI equals, and I'm going to tell it where to find my directory, my uh, Git-based directory, full of configuration. In this case, it'll be on the file system. And finally, I want to tell this server to run on port 8888. Now, I don't have this directory yet, right? So I need to go get that here uh, from Beautiful Microservices config. And we'll clone that onto my directory here. OK, and it doesn't matter if it's an HTTP URL or a local file system URL, so long as you have a folder full of property or YAML files, it'll work just fine. Now, Let's imagine that I am the reservation service, right? That service that we just created over here, we have records of type reservation. So this is the reservation service. What information would that service see if we connected it to the config service? We can see what it would see by going to the config server on port 8888 and then looking for the information for the reservation hyphen service. And there, we'll see two sets of properties, two sources of properties, or two property sources. One called application of properties, which every microservice will see, regardless of their name. And one called reservation hyphen service of properties, which only the microservice that is called reservation service will see. And this will run on port 8000. This one will run on, you know, and this one will run on uh, any random, unused, unassigned port. So all microservices, no matter what, will see this information. If there's a difference between this and this, then the more specific file, this one, overrides this one. We also have a message here, hello world. So let's go ahead and change our reservation service here and point it and just have it draw its configuration from the config server, which it will do because we have Spring Cloud Starter Config Client on the class path. We have to tell it where to find the configuration, though. So we say Spring Cloud Config URI equals HTTP localhost 8888. And we're going to also teach it how to identify itself. We're going to tell it to call itself the reservation service. And then by convention, Spring Cloud will look for this, these two properties in a text file called bootstrap.properties, not application. And so now, if we've done everything correctly, this application, which was running on port 8080, will now also run on port 8000. And we should be able to uh, see that message that was in the config server. So private, final, string, value, create a constructor, at autowired. message, right? So now if I do everything correctly, I can string message return this dot value request mapping value equals message. There you go. So this is my very simple endpoint. Now let's go ahead and restart this using that information. <laughs> Now, localhost 8000 forward slash message. Hello. There it is. So there's my message. It worked. We got the information live. But that message isn't great. It works, but it's not great. We can do a better job. So let's go back to the config directory here. Open up this directory. Hello. Reservation service properties. And we'll change this message to say, Hola, Spring IO. And extra exclamation marks. This is for Reddit. Okay. So now, git commit minus m minus a YOLO. Okay. And if we go to the config server, we can see that it immediately sees the change. But this has no idea yet. And we can tell it to force a reconfiguration a few different ways. We can use an event bus, which is easy, or we can just tell it explicitly by calling the actuator framework. The actuator framework has contributed an endpoint here called refresh, like this. So it's taking an empty HTTP post. There it is. Whoop. Hello, computer. Oh, it didn't work. You know why? First of all, because I haven't had much sleep. 
And second of all, because that, which is more important. So, we'll try it again one more time, this time with more gusto, okay? Once it's started up, we're going to make another change. What I've done here is I've annotated the bean to be refreshable, so that means that it'll redraw its configuration. It'll re-inject this message from the config server on demand. And once it does that, we can see the results immediately. So let's go back here again and just change it to one or two. Okay, git commit. And now we do this, but let me line this up. There we go. And there we go. All right. So it was the old value. I hit refresh, and it triggered the new value immediately. So now we have centralized configuration, which becomes very useful in the distributed systems world, where you have more than a few services, and you want to centralize that information. Moving on, when you move to distributed systems world, the next pattern that you're going to care about when you move to this architecture is the ability to talk about other services abstractly, to not worry too much about where they live and on which hosts and ports they live. In order to do this, you could use DNS, but DNS is a poor fit in a cloud environment for a lot of reasons. First of all, it is a very dumb protocol. It doesn't know how to answer questions like, is this service available? Is it responding? It doesn't also have the ability to support interesting kinds of load balancing. You could use a load balancer, of course, and that will have a checkbox, something like, you know, do round robin, but that load balancer is very, very dumb. It doesn't know about business logic specific kinds of load balancing, like uh, multi-tenancy or data center aware load balancing, etc. cetera. Uh, and also, DNS, usually in a cloud environment, requires that you leave the cloud and then come back in through the router. It, it, it requires an extra hop, an extra latency. So for all of these reasons and more, we want something like DNS. We want the table from services, uh, service IDs to service host and ports, the dispatch table. But we want to get the, way, get the effect some other way, a little bit more intelligently. So we can use a service registry. And there are many different service registries out there. Spring Cloud provides interesting implementations for Apache Zookeeper, HashiCorp Console, and uh, Netflix's Eureka. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to go here and build Eureka using Spring Boot because it's very simple to set up. And we'll stand it up and register our services to talk to it. Okay. So Eureka service application at enable Eureka server application dot property Spring Cloud config URI equals localhost. Whoops, localhost. Spring dot application name. Okay, I'm going to rename this file to bootstrap.properties and go. And that'll start on port 8761. Now, what we need to do is go back to our reservation service and have it call the registry and say, listen, I'm here. This is my host. This is my port. If anybody needs me, I'm here, right? So I'll say, I've got Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. That's the discovery client abstraction implementation that works for Eureka. And we're going to turn on that feature here like this. Now, localhost 8761, here's our registry. Good quality animated GIF. But no services yet. Remember, I, added, I just added the annotation. It's still starting, but eventually it'll be there. So there it is, right? Reservation service. There's a service IP, the, the name, and so on. And so now we have the ability to build a client to talk to our service. And we're going to build a very special kind of client something called an edge service. An edge service is a component that lives at the edge of your data center, at the edge of the architecture, responding to actual clients like phones and PlayStations and Androids and Xboxes and Teslas and in the Internet of Things or the industrial internet, things like your microwave. These are all clients that talk to your microservices. And your clients have different kinds of security, payload, and protocol requirements. So you can't change every single microservice each time you add a new client. Instead, change the edge service. The edge service is client-specific. You might have an HTML5 edge service. You might have an Android edge service, etc. So we're going to say we want Hystrix as well. We want Zool, the microproxy. We want Zipkin for distributed tracing, RabbitMQ for stream processing. Uh, we want REST repository support. We want uh, hypermedia support. Okay, And that, I think, will do it for now. Let's go ahead and see what we get. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how to introduce traffic to the downstream service, but we're going to handle um, different kinds of things here at the edge service. The simplest kind of edge, edge service 
is something called a microproxy. Now, a microproxy is just an edge service that forwards the requests from the outside uh, down to the microservices in the, in the architecture, in the, uh, in the service registry. And it does so blindly. It doesn't actually change or transform or translate the data. It just forwards and forwards requests and replies back and forth. So we can build one of those very simply by using Netflix's Zool microproxy. Okay? Zool, let me start this up. Zool, if you follow your Ghostbusters and Greek mythology, is the gatekeeper al inferno. Okay? Now, that's what I thought he was. This is from the movie Ghostbusters, right? And I thought that was the, the, the monster from hell. But my friend said, you know, Josh, that's not fair. That's not fair. We don't know that he comes from hell. He could come from a very nice place. We don't know. It's not fair to judge. And that's true. So I'm sorry. Anyway, this is now up. And what, what Zoo will do is it'll automatically set up routes, mappings, on my edge service here at localhost 9999. And it's going to create routes from the outside to the back-end services that we have registered in Eureka. Remember, your iPhone is not going to use Eureka. It's going to use DNS. It will talk to your service on this DNS endpoint. But then your edge service, when it talks to everything else, will use Eureka. It'll use service registration and discovery to look up the services. And so that's what's happening here, is it's automatically going to route requests for us, localhost 9999, and then it'll, this is the service ID, and there's the um, reservations. So remember, we created that REST API earlier. Here's all the data, spring.rest, right? Spring hot TOS. What we have here is a collection of reservations. Here's the actual microservice in which the data lives. And you can see here we've got an envelope object. This envelope is called a resource. R resource, right? It has a payload of type reservation, right? This is a part of Spring hot TOS. So this resource is a JSON structure. It's HAL, or hypermedia application language, encoded. It contains links and a payload. And now if I go to the edge service, my JavaScript client, for example, might call the edge service, and it wants to talk to the back-end back reservation service. And it can do that. I just pass in the service ID and then the path. And notice that the Zool proxy even sends a filter. It sends a header, rather, to the downstream service so that it can rewrite the URLs. And this is very, very powerful. If I have foo service, for example, or bar service, or, you know, customer service, whatever, inside of, the, uh, inside of the service registry, I can access them all here from the same host and port. This is very useful, for example, if you're trying to build an HTML5 application. HTML5 clients are very powerful. They have a lot of browser bandwidth and, and RAM and so on, but they run inside of a sandbox. So it's very hard for them to call different hosts and ports. You can get around this by just proxying everything through one well-known host and port. And who knows, maybe this is enough. Maybe this is enough. Maybe you add HTTP basic, add SSL, and you're done, right? Or OAuth, certainly. And maybe you're done. Maybe your JavaScript developers are now able to talk to all your downstream services very easily. One question to ask, of course, is which instance of the service is it calling? We know that we have one instance of my service registered in Eureka. But if, what if there's 10? Which does it call? And it makes that decision using something called Ribbon. Ribbon is a client-side load balancer from Netflix. Ribbon is basically a very, a very fancy comparator. It does the, it does the uh, equivalent of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and it picks one for you. But you can control the strategy that it uses. So this is not in the DNS load balancer. It's in the client, in the Java code. It picks the instances by calling Eureka. It gets all the service instances back, and then it makes a request. And this is all set up for you automatically. Now, this might be enough. We may want to do something more, of course. We may want to actually have um, something that actually reads the data and then transforms it. We call that mediation. This kind of edge service isn't so dumb as, a, as the Zool microproxy. Instead, it's a little bit more intelligent. We call this kind of edge service an API gateway. So we'll build a very simple API gateway. We'll say reservation, API gateway, REST controller. Whew. We'll say at REST controller, and we're going to map this endpoint to uh, forward slash reservations. 
and we're going to create an endpoint here that returns just the set of the names that are in the database, right? Not the whole hypermedia envelope JSON, just the names. So we're going to say request mapping method equals git value equals names. And we're going to get the names by using the rest template. So we'll say private final rest template. Whoops. And that rest template will inject in the constructor here. Whoops. Now, of course, we want our rest template to also be aware of the load balancing that Ribbon provides. So I'm going to return a custom rest template like this, but I'm going to tell Spring Cloud that I want that uh, rest template to be load balanced and available as well. So that's going to turn on the Ribbon aware load balancing. And once I've done that, I can now issue a very simple call, rest template.exchange, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations. I'm going to say HTTP git, okay, HTTP method dot git. And we're going to send that no body, so it's a null. And then finally, we need to tell the REST template what kind of data we want back. What I would love to be able to say is, of course, give me the, reservation, give me the resources of type reservation dot class. But that won't work because Java doesn't have a generic type system at runtime. So you can capture that information. You can express the idea of a generic parameter using something called a type token hack. <laughs> Uh, pattern, <laughs> pattern. Um, so we can say new parameterized type reference of resources of reservation. Okay. Now this still doesn't work, of course, because I don't have this type on the class path. I could, of course, copy the type from the service, but I don't want to assume that I'm going to have the same language uh, or compatible interface on the uh, client and the service. I don't want to couple my implementation either. Who knows what this entity looks like on the server side on the implementation. Remember that the entity that we created in the service is using JPA annotations. What does it say in the back? 10 minutes? 20 minutes? I can't even see it. So 15. <laughs> 35, good. So we're just going to create a reservation entity there. And uh, we'll create a response entity, and we'll say, I don't want the status code. That's nice, but I don't want it. I don't need the headers. What I want is the body. And then, oh, uh, oh right, this is here. Okay. Get content stream dot map, and then I'm going to map from every R to a reservation name. I could use a lambda here, so um, there you go. And I'm going to collect it into a list. And that's a very, very simple edge service. I'm just taking the data, transforming it, and then sending it back to the client. Maybe my client only needs part of the data. It doesn't need all the extra JSON. Maybe it's memory constrained, whatever, right? Naturally, if you're, using, if you're making more than one call here at the same time, you might want to make these things concurrent. And this is an ideal place to use something like Project Reactor to do reactive uh, concurrent calls of different services and then zip them up. In my case, I know that I've only got so many records in the database, but if I have a lot of data, I also want to be able to stream that, which is another thing that you can do very easily if you express this stuff, uh, if you express this, for example, in terms of a, of a reactor flux, right? So, okay, very simple edge service. Let's see if that works. So oh, localhost, a9999, forward slash reservations, forward slash names. Oop, hello. There we go. So there's my data. I'm not sure why it's an XML at all. Reservation. Eh, whatever. So it, there's the data. It's coming back just fine. Uh, this will work if there are one or more instances of the downstream reservation service available. But what happens if there are zero? Remember, part one of a building of a cloud-native architecture is to support observability. Part two is to support elasticity, right? Build an application that does the right thing given the dynamics of cloud scaling, right? Uh, and then part three, of course, is to optimize for time the remediation. Build an application that fails correctly. It degrades gracefully. 
In our case, this is going to blow chunks, and our poor iPhone users are going to get a big fat sta stack trace in their, in their experience, in their client. So we need to do something better. We need to be a little bit more resilient. We need to be a little bit more graceful and degrade. We need to understand that failure, like death and like taxes, will happen in a sufficiently distributed system. Instead of trying to build a system where one node is available 100% of the time, instead, try, try to build a system where it takes zero seconds to get something else online. The effect is, uh, the effect is basically the same. You're effectively 100% highly available. But the approach has very dramatic implications on the way you build your system. If you have something like a Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry will restart the service for you, right? But it's our job as developers to give that downstream service time to recover. And in the meantime, we need to not blow chunks each time there's a little bit of a, of a hiccup. So we're going to use a circuit breaker to introduce a little bit of graceful degradation. So I'll say at enables circuit breaker. And I'll wrap this method here. I'll say at hystrix command. And I'll say that the fallback method, which is a method that's going to be invoked when something goes wrong, is called fallback. And in the fallback method, I'm just going to return an empty array list of string like this. Okay. Now, the goal here is to do something if something goes wrong. And this component, this circuit breaker, is stateful. If enough, if, if enough exceptions are thrown, it'll move the tracks always to the fallback method. Eventually, it'll try to reintroduce traffic. But in the meantime, we've given our downstream service time to breathe. We all know, after all, that if, if the website that you're trying to visit isn't working, you should refresh the browser more, right? Isn't that true now? Now, well, it's not true in distributed systems either. So we need to give that downstream service time to, to breathe. So let's see. <clears throat> There's our data. OK, it's working. Now we go to the reservation service here, and we kill it. And now we hit refresh. And it's trying to make the request, but it's not happening. It's failing. But it's, trying to, it's going to time out eventually. I can force it to go immediately to the fallback by calling this. There you go. See, now it's not struggling. It's not hesitating. I refresh, and it goes immediately to that endpoint. That's because the circuit breaker opened, and no more traffic is going through. This gives us graceful degradation. Netflix does this kind of thing all the time. They'll say, oh, you called the search engine service, but it's not available right now. Here are some machine learned recommendations from across the web. So we've talked about now one way to introduce resilience. If you're doing writes instead of reads, you might use something like Spring Cloud Stream. Spring Cloud Stream makes it very easy to eventually deliver, based on messaging, based on something called Spring Integration underneath the hood, um, to deliver messages to a downstream service using a message broker, something like a Kafka or a RabbitMQ. Spring Cloud Stream is a great way to ensure that when you write and the, ser the service is not available, you still get the right results instead of just dropping state on the floor like a Node.js application. Right? Now, in our last several minutes together here, I want to talk a little bit about the emergent behavior of systems. So we've, I talked a little bit about observability. You'll recall that the Spring, you'll recall that Spring Boot um, has the actuator framework. And the actuator framework is a set of endpoints that get contributed uh, to the runtime, to the application when it starts up, that support understanding what the system is doing. To, that gives you information about the, the host and node specific runtime, the memory, the heap, the non-heap, metrics, things like this. But these are all node specific. They don't tell you about the whole story of the system. So what we want to do is look at two ever so briefly. We've only got, let's say, nine minutes together. <laughs> Uh, um, so we want to support understanding what the system is doing. One way to do this is to use distributed tracing. Distributed tracing is very simple in theory. As a request enters the system, you take the, uh, the message, you add a, a header, a unique UUID, and then you make sure that when that message leaves the system, it has the UUID. And then make sure that this is true in every place in the system where you have it. So I'll say, that, I'm going to use this, got that, I'm going to use the config client, Eureka service registration discovery, hit generate, I'll open this up, okay, at enable discoveries client, at enable zipkin server, 
application of properties. <clears throat> okay, and bootstrap that properties. Now, distributed tracing is well supported by Spring Cloud Sleuth. Sleuth. Sleuth is an abstraction that already provides a lot of value uh, for what we're trying to do. It automatically adds interceptors to the code to make sure that whenever you, um, whenever a message arrives or, or leaves the system, that it automatically gets traced. And you can see that reflected here, oops, in the console. Uh, well, you can already, let's see. Okay, there's this. What is this? Where's Phil Webb when you need him? Protocol, wrong type for socket. There's something wrong with my code and I don't know what it is. But it's not affecting us now, so we'll move on. What I want to show you is... Hmm. Okay, let's just try it. So if I make a request here, hopefully, if everything is going correctly, that should be tracing it for me, 9411. There's my distributed tracing system, yep. So this is Zipkin, this is what we just created. Zipkin is a distributed tr tracing system that was created by Twitter. It's used to visualize the flow of messages through a system. As we use, as we create the services and as they make calls from one service to another using Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Integration, using the MicroProxy on Zool, using Spring MVC or the REST template, uh, using Fane, which is also from Netflix for declarative REST clients, if we use all of these different things, they all automatically have intercepted uh, behavior. They all automatically trace requests. And that information is also being sent out of band here to Zipkin, which I've just uh, created for you here, right? That's, uh, oh, that's this, this is Zipkin. So I've got Zipkin here, and you can see that as I make requests here, localhost, 9999, forward slash reservation service, forward slash reservations, and the reservations names, as I do that, now I can see the information here, and I can go down to reservation hyphen service, hit find trace, and you can see one here, four, four spans. If I click on this, I can see that I made a request that entered the reservation client at HTTP reservations forward slash names. It left the reservation client uh, at 14 milliseconds afterwards, or you know, absolute time, and uh, entered. You know, it left at the uh, it left to go to something called the HTTP reservations. Where? Well, it was on the reservation service, and I can see the total time that the whole request took. The whole time was 18 milliseconds. And I can see that as data left, it went from one node to another. I can click on the details here, whoops, to get the logs showing you when the messages entered and exited the system. This gives me a visible view of the whole system, not just specific nodes. I can also see the ontology here, the topology. I can see, for example, that this service is connected to this one and that right now there have been 18 requests that have passed through it and so on. So you get this all just by using Zipkin. Now, Zipkin is not meant to support warehousing. You're not going to use this for customer service. This is not going to help you answer the question, what did Jane do on the website two years ago? Instead, this is meant to support online telemetry. It's meant to help you understand how is the system doing right now, what is the average latency, etc. Twitter, for example, only collects one out of every six million requests, right? So this is a, a very, very powerful system. You should not plan on collecting everything. Now, we are, my friends, woefully out of time, and I regret that, but uh, if we had more time, maybe someday, somewhere, somehow, we could have covered a little bit more, uh, and I regret that we didn't have that time this time. Uh, today, we talked ever so briefly about the motivations for uh, agile iteration and how that informs the architecture that we build. We talked about how to build applications that benefit from the elasticity of the cloud and that take advantage of things like client-side load balancing and service registration and discovery implicitly you know, and, and you easily at all stacks of the, uh, of the application. We talked about how to support observability by using, for example, the actuator and uh, um, Zipkin for distributed tracing. We could have looked also at the Hystrix dashboard. And finally, we also talked about 
building systems that do the right thing given a dynamic cloud-based environment that degrade gracefully when there's a risk of a failure. So, entonces, uh, gracias mil veces por venir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Cheers.